architecture and urbanism here in one of the schools. It's my uh, great pleasure to introduce Michael Sorkin, a friend, colleague, and mentor, not just to me, but to a generation of architects and urbanists who were seeking uh, a critical voice, one not hesitant to take a position regardless of whether or not it was what people wanted to hear or whether it disrupted chances for a job. Yeah, he's here, he's here. There he goes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it gets better. Yeah. Michael Sorkin has been famed as a leading architecture critic and writer, but in fact, he is much more than that. His pen is as powerful in drawing as it is with words. Both share a flow of creativity, imagination, and critique. Michael has a great talent for architecture. To say that one talent does not necessarily come in the place of the other. You can write and design and do both exceptionally well. Here he acts as an inspiration to an entire generation, a generation that understands the importance, power, necessity, and responsibility to both write and design. But the question remains, do we have or will have the integrity and courage to speak our minds? And how important is it to give space to critical voice in our discipline? Michael leads a global architecture practice with a special interest in urbanism. Current work includes projects in China, Australia, Chicago, Gaza, and New York City. Since 2000, Sorkin has been distinguished professor of architecture and director of the graduate program in urban design at City College of New York. His previous academic appointments include professor of urbanism and director of the Institute of Urbanism at the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna, the Gensler Chair at Cornell University, the Davenport and Bishop. I'm going through, I mean, it just, yeah, yeah, it just, yeah, it just gets, you know, the list gets longer. Uh, at Yale and professorships uh, at the Architects Association, Cooper Union, Harvard University, and Columbia University. Sorkin is currently architecture critic uh, for The Nation, contributing editor uh, at Architecture Record, and author or editor of 20 books. These include, <laughs> wait, <laughs> sit down, <laughs> sit down. <laughs> uh, variations on a theme park, exquisite, exquisite corpse, local code, giving ground, wiggle, some assembly required, other plans. The next Jerusalem, it reads like one, I think, right? After the Trade Center, starting from zero, analyzing Ambaz, against the wall, indefensible space, New Orleans under reconstruction, all over the map in 20 minutes in Manhattan. <laughs> In 2005, uh, Sorkin founded Terraform, a center for urban research and advocacy, and is currently its president, as well as its editor-in-chief of its book imprint, You Are Urban Research, founded in 2015. Sorkin serves on many academic, civic, and editorial boards, including <laughs> vice president of the Urban Design Forum. Okay, I'm gonna skip here. Uh, and has been the recipient of numerous fellowships and award, including membership in the National Academy of Arts and Science, the Design Mind National Design Award, and most recently, this year's Collaborative Achievement Award from the AIA. And by the way, Sorkin is also the Urban Design. Yeah. Thank you, darling. <laughs> Brenda. <laughs> Which button did you push to advance to the slides? Yeah, I, I, I told you, you know, if you want to kill a student audience, you're not, you're not supposed to give them the screen to use them for. <laughs> <laughs> so, good to be back at the old school for my last lecture. <clears throat> Are we ready? <clears throat> There's no more to the introduction? Um, so I, I've been planning to give up giving lectures, <coughs> but I keep getting cajoled out of it. If I can find the nerve, though, this could be my last. Um, these formal performances cause too much advanced anxiety, and writing out the text and gathering the images, weeks of torture for an hour's entertainment, is cruel. 
um, especially as the door to senescence swings open and so many incompletes still need to be crossed off. I did once delight in the performative part of these presentations, facing the abyss, throwing a slide on the screen and winging it. Um, of course, I wasn't really out on a limb. That spontaneous act was cobbled together from a well-stuffed grab bag of tropes, memes, and shtick. Um, teaching is getting a little bit like that, too. I keep hearing myself repeating myself. Picture a dinner party. Um, you offer up your best jokes, hoping you haven't retailed them to that crowd before. But working yourself into a merry mood over and over ultimately leaves you in an enervated space where the shop-worn jest has lost the zingeriness of its zing to you, um, but still draws a laugh from the guests. Although my talks are always meant to be serious, um, I now judge their effect almost completely by the success of the laugh lines. Um, I often speak in China, I'm fruitlessly waiting time after time for the silence to explode into yucks. Um, at one talk that was being simultaneously translated for a huge audience, I remember the crushing flop of an anecdote I thought was especially hilarious and that always worked. Um, afterwards, I asked a friend what had happened. He told me the translation had been, the speaker is now telling a joke. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> uh, I've always enjoyed being provocative, e even offensive, um, but this too can miscarry. Um, <clears throat> uh, a particularly memorable incitement uh, uh, was inadvertent and took place about 30 years ago in Edmonton. Um, the title of the talk was Family Values, um, which at the time uh, was a much bandied Reaganoid dog whistle to his Neanderthal base. Um, my usage was obviously ironic, uh, meant to describe the familiar relations among the somewhat biomorphic work I was doing at the time. Unfortunately, this wasn't clear to some who'd heard about the lecture on the radio and the first row of the auditorium was filled with actual fundamentalists who were mystified and outraged. Uh, <coughs> I guess I would call that a success. Um, there can be a narcotic out-of-body quality to performance, a relaxing immersion in your own other, a wanting to nail it but completely out of time as you do. In a weird semi-interregnum, I spent a year um, with very modest success um, trying to be an actor uh, in New York. I was not good. Um, but because I was well-educated, well-spoken, and literate in English, um, I had a gift for cold auditions. Uh, unlike many competing for the parts, kids who moved directly from being starstruck high school thespians to a shot at Broadway, I had three university degrees and knew how to read and so quickly assimilated the unfamiliar script I was handed. I got cast. The high point of my theatrical career was dinner theater on the Jersey Shore, an actual paying gig. We were performing that hoary, totally hokey, temperance melodrama, The Drunkard. Um, still the longest running production in American theater history, and I was cast as Cribs, the villain. Um, I waxed my mustache and played it in my best snidely whiplash style, demanding the long-suffering heroine pay her rent at once and threatening some horrible whatever if she didn't. Part of our meager salary was paid in the currency of dinner. Um, and before the performance, we gorged at the Club Buff Benet's legendary pasta buffet. The proprietress of the establishment carefully supervised the proceedings to intercede if we reached for any of the higher priced items. Don't even think of getting near those cocktail shrimp. Um, but we were starving actors and so carb loaded on extremis, which left our performances somewhat dyspeptic uh, for the first act or two. Um, there was much backstage um, manufacture of farting noises. Uh, um, uh, in an effort to send up the players out front, and I almost invariably succumbed with a giggle. 
the whole thing was entertainingly ridiculous, although I did get off a good line one night when a plastered patron in the first row of tables shouted at me, get off the stage, you fool. I stepped through the fourth wall and replied that I may have been a fool, but I wasn't the one who'd paid 32.50 to see me. <laughs> um, this all happened after I'd finished architecture school. Uh, as many of my comrades struggled to find sympathetic spaces that might help rectify or at least do no harm to the riven world. Um, uh, or like my time on the boards to hide out a bit before getting serious. I did my university studies from the, let me clear the slides, from the mid 60s uh, to the mid 70s and, and the times were definitely a changing. The war was on, as were struggles for civil, civil and gender rights. Um, more urgent things were happening in the street than um, calculating bending moments or sizing ducks. Um, we wanted to bring youth culture uh, and the movement back to the studio to build a design school Soviet. Um, the powers that be at the GSB, however, were not amused by my efforts to organize a tuition strike against an education I was obnoxiously uh, proclaiming to be worthless um, uh, in my defense. Uh, the school truly was at um, rock bottom with a clueless dean from the business school installed to put the fiscal chaos to right and critics whose main qualification was that they had worked for people who had worked for Korb. Um, um, this dogmatic position uh, begged the question of why stay at all? Um, I'd always loved architecture and from the tender age got especially high on the labyrinthine mosaic of cities. Unfortunately, back then, hitchhiking was still safe, flights to Europe were dirt cheap, and I gorged on urbanity everywhere, except, of course, in Spain and Greece. Um, we didn't go there. Actually, um, uh, so I managed to transfer to MIT, um, where the debate was more serious and much less self-congratulatory. Um, there was a cadre of cool urbanists centered on Kevin Lynch, uh, and the camp campus buildings were themselves labyrinthine. Um, Alvar Alto and Henri Lefebvre were my load stars, a combination that still seems right, and Noam Chomsky was holding forth on the other side of campus. Our self-built studio looked like a favela, an object of great veneration, especially by John Turner and John Habrocken, who thought of them as exemplars of radical self-management and self-help powered by freedom and enterprise. The fashion statement du jour um, was bib overalls, accessorized with a claw hammer. Um, not for me. If I had a hammer, I wanted it with a sickle. Um, <laughs> um, just before graduation, I was offered a job in the John Lindsay era New York City Department of Social Services as design director for a high priority program to open 100 daycare centers for senior citizens. And how dispiriting now to be one, uh, to flash that giveaway white Metro card, to get daily junk mail from AARP, uh, to confront the insane row of prescription meds above the sink every morning and chat with my cohort about disease. Um, amazingly, we managed to get them up and running in little over a year. The centers were to be housed in existing catering halls, church basements, or function rooms in the housing project. Almost any safe and accessible space of about 10,000 square feet. And in the process of, uh, process of inspecting them, I traveled all over town learning the city. The site inspections I performed were, shall we say, uh, ill-informed and often included my jumping off a chair with my hand cupped to my ear to listen for the reverberations of structural insecurity. Everyone was impressed by my acumen. I also acted as audience for the spectacle of competing community organizations shamelessly pitching for the project. Fortunately, this choice was not my call and I deeply admired the equanimity of my colleague Thelma as she weighed competing claims um, from the Panthers and the laboratory. 
Um, our little architectural department wasn't actually empowered to design the center, but when the chosen community group submitted plans, drawn up by the cousin of the director or some other well-connected local operative, we redrew them overnight and let them know that should, they, should the plan they resubmitted resemble the one we'd given them back, I'd be likely to approve it. We'd invariably get back exactly what we'd drawn with a new title block. Um, there was, however, one particular experience about two decades ago um, that was a major turning point. I'd flown to Australia um, <coughs> for a series of talks, and most were picture presentations of work, which I could pretty much do in my sleep. One, however, was to be about something more bespoke. I can't remember exactly what. And I decided to wing it from notes. Never a problem, zip the gab, quick on my feet. Um, standing before a packed house, I unfolded my jumbo jet jottings, looked down at them, opened my mouth to speak, and froze. Um, complete mental paralysis. I couldn't say a word. There was excruciating silence as I eyed my notes, then the audience, then the notes again. The sympathetic organizers called for a break, took me in the garden, offered me water, whiskey, Coke, the, the one on the left, uh, and tried to buck me up for another go. It was no use. Not exactly stage fright, and the crowd was clearly friendly, maybe sudden onset jet lag, or scariest of all, a panic of unknown origin. Uh, unpredictable, could strike at any time. From then on, I began to write out my lecture. Um, after a year at the Bureau of Purchased Social Services for Adults, another perfectly timed bolt from the blue landed me a teaching gig at the AA in swinging London. There, I enacted the same crimes of inexperience I'd so vehemently assailed at the GSD, um, if with a little more funky je ne sais quoi. Um, I'd been to their summer session. Uh, uh, and gotten to know Archigram, Archizoom, Cedric Price, and the other cool cats of the day. When I arrived for the second time, the school was near collapse, and the doorman was admitting students direct from the street. Um, then Alvin Boyarsky worked his usual magic, and the place was saved, with a slightly simplified version. Um, I did know of homegrown heroes like um, Steve Bear and the Zomeworks, Survival Research Lab, uh, The New Alchemists, uh, and Antfon. Um, I'd gone with my mother um, to Expo 67 to see Habitat uh, and that big Bucky Dome, but I couldn't find a meaningful way into this world. I thought these practices were escapist, frivolous, apolitical, or demanded a lifestyle too rigorous for me. Uh, I am a sucker for indoor plumbing. Um, I had spent six months on a kibbutz and found both the farming and the communalism invigorating, even inspirational, but I was happy um, that I had a ticket home. I passed some time at a vegetarian commune in Maine and built an unmentionable building, my first, um, but Thanksgiving with tofu turkey just didn't cut it. Um, when I returned from the UK, I, I began to write a column in the Village Voice I saw this as an arguably legitimate form of alternative practice, a coarse category that included advocacy, organizing, working as a barefoot architect in Newark or Mumbai, building yurts in the woods, or just drawing alone. Like writing about architecture, these choices seemed inauthentic or um, King Canudish. Um, architecture was inescapable, inescapable and all these appeared to be diminished versions of the real thing, whatever that was, um, even though my training gave my writing extra authority. Um, um, I was befriended by architects whose rivals uh, oxen I'd gored or scores I'd settled. Um, Marcel Breuer uh, invited me for martinis after a particularly energetic excoriation of our favorite Nazi, Philip Johnson. Um, I got to know Paul Rudolph, whose work I'd always admired, um, sometimes in print. Um, we became friends, and Paul came to reviews of my students' mystifying projects pinned up on the walls of his building at Yale. He always took the work seriously and spoke about it generously. Encouraged by praise from these greats, 
I got back to Goring in my fulminating uh, ad hominem private eye style, which stood out from the more temperate, not to say ass licking, tone of most criticism at the time. Um, but the Robespierre role was getting creepier and creepier. When I spotted someone on the subway reading my column, I'd move to the next car. Um, <coughs> My minor league celebrity led to more teaching, first criticism in theory, then design. Um, as you know, higher, higher education is an origin point for the gig economy. Administrators love adjuncts. No commitment, no health plan, no pension, no living wage, no problem. Um, uh, it was perfect for me, though. Um, I was fine with these uh, love them and leave them deals and got good at parachute studios. And before long, I hit the A-list. Um, I've now taught at 29 schools. Uh, yeah, you left some out, Raffi. <laughs> uh, 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 including 10 years at Cooper, stem, seven at the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna, and now almost 20 at CCNY. In my jet set days, I thought that a dozen people were teaching every studio in America. Um, but this, this passion for fashion does keep going. I mean, take a look at the lecture posters in the hall. Whatever the school, they're all the same. I have no idea how David Ajay does it. Um, despite my academic longevity, the those who can't teach apprehension bugged me deeply. Um, I spent a year working uh, for the only architect ever to employ me, a brilliant, eccentric, ironic Texan um, who probably knows more about the quiddity of building than anyone on earth. Um, Columbia 68 raised his consciousness and he founded this practice to live out this transformation via the idea that architecture had to be constructive. I worked on advocacy planning projects and tenement rehab, but I continued to think real architecture was just neoliberalism in creeps clothing. Um, I looked at buildings and saw the man, um, but sometimes the beast had on your vest. Um, the first explicitly architectural demonstration I joined was organized by TAR, um, the Architects Resistance, um, and took place outside the offices of SOM, um, which, was the, which was then working on the Carlton Center, the centerpiece of apartheid Johannesburg. My placard avowed that somewhere upstairs, an architect was designing two bathrooms, one black and another white. Um, there were so many righteous group of skills back then, um, from those Italians all flirty with the red brigades, um, squatters on the Lower East Side, the weathermen. I even organized a short duration one at MIT called Reds, um, Radical Environmental Designers. Um, we put on a good conference. Um, the keynoter was Murray Bookchin, who el eloquently confirmed the choir in its views. And then school was over. Um, I was never much of a nine to fiver. Um, this wasn't just circadian. I grew up in the suburbs watching the ebb and flow of our commuter dads carpooling to their government jobs, wearing well-pressed suits and inoffensive ties, complaining about their idiot bosses when they got home. I should have worked for an architect I admired, um, Herman Hertzberger or Giancarlo De Carlo say, but I'd taken so many accidental opportunities, it was too late to be a beginner. Time to pursue my own project. New York rents were cheap, and I'd won a handsome sum on a TV quiz show, um, uh, enabling a loft in Soho uh, and a year of paid indecision. Um, I was locked in the prison of my own freedom. But what was my project? I kept circling it, writing both criticism and crap to pay the rent, TV and film scripts including doc documentaries about architecture and urbanism, doing political stuff, including editing at a magazine uh, that aspired to become the left's alternative to time. I was teaching around and hot gluing models uh, from scrap wood in the bedroom. Um, eventually, I bit the bullet and began to do classic starters work, interiors. My first commissions were for labor unions and civil liberties groups, which seemed righteous enough. Um, I was, however, embarrassingly enthusiastic for that post-Sergeant Pepper Memphis style at the time, and I can't believe I actually inflicted it on my clients. It was very popular back then. I became friendly 
um, with a, a master of interior space, another MIT graduate, called Alan Buxbaum, whose work is at the headwaters of the downtown, buy it all on Canal Street, Soho loft style. Alan adored showbiz and had many clients from Broadway and Hollywood. One day he offered to fix me up with a job redoing an apartment for some celebrity couple on Central Park West, a done deal thanks to Alan's imprimatur. I immediately went to speak with my new clients about their expectations for the do-over. The conversation quickly arrived at the question of closet space. And I began to hear a wee voice, a wee voice within me repeating over and over, I don't give a shit, 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 as suggested by my boss. Um, this rupture recap recapitulated an earlier door slamming epiphany shortly after I'd started my second PhD uh, program, this time in art history. The other one was, was English. Um, I, I um, as I say, I wanted to do architectural history and theory, but discovered that students were obliged, a clog, um, uh, uh, to study the field broadly for a couple of years before getting to their chosen subject. As I was also trying to do the theatrical thing at the time, my schedule demanded that I take courses um, that met either on Tuesdays or Wednesdays. Um, this constraint forced me to enroll in an amazingly, uh, unimaginably boring class on attic red-figured jugs. One day, uh, in a reasonably enjoyable sem seminar on cinema, uh, as the professor preened for the fun and sycophants on either side of him at the long table, it came in a flash. I didn't need it. Um, standing up and gesturing for silence, I told the class that I had been ambivalent, even tortured, about getting yet another degree, but had just had a moment of clarity for which I wanted to thank. I went directly to South Station and never looked back. <laughs> um, having rejected the conventional interiors to additions to houses, to small civic buildings, to a par partnership at Gensler trajectory, um, I needed to find a route past go in a hurry. I began to make creatures. Um, there was no prior, prior agenda for this biomorphism. Uh, which comes really after, about 10 years later. Um, uh, but the form spoke to me. Um, bilateral symmetry was a useful point of departure, um, and the, the representational vocabulary was clearly at odds with over-theorized uh, uh, art world, the over-theorized art world, think Don Judd, um, uh, uh, with architectures, um, theoretical practitioners, think Peter Eisman, uh, with their, his efforts uh, to cram more and more meaning into smaller and smaller space, uh, effectively psychoanalyzing columns. Um, the forms also gave the finger, I thought, to the metastatic alternative, the, me mim the mimetic disease of drive it historicism, as Bob put it, family values. Um, the animal goofiness, the imaginary building flipping the imaginary bird, um, protected me from anxieties about the social utility of building as objects, even as I longed to make some. I believed, sort of, um, that this work uh, elected affinities with other insubordinate styles and practices, and assumed that the uh, dog and the frog had some kinship with all those inflatables, nomadologies, globe-girdling grids, and comic book hyperbole. Um, we persevered along this line, culminating around 1992 in the most monstrous of them all, the villa. Um, the bestiary started to gain traction. The work was published. We won a PA award for a suite of houses um, commissioned by a Russian mafioso for a beach in Jamaica, uh, making fish forms appropriate, habitable, contextual, uh, responsive, and undangerous. The client did wonder, as the job uh, started to dry up, if we could build these structures in marble, uh, which he claimed could be had for an extremely good price in Urkutsk. Um, we demurred. Um, as, as you may have gathered, I, I, I've always put my faith in miracles. Um, invited to show something at Artist Space in 1989, I built this um, 16 by 16 foot model uh, of a city of mind and eye. 
And I, I've actually never experienced more flow as during the months it took me to make the film. Um, I was reasonably skilled with power tools, had a fine Swiss bandsaw, um, and was brooding on the kind of lone creator, homo, fa homo faber fantasies, um, uh, the actual bane of real film. Um, but I had become an urbanist. I was teaching urban design, writing about cities, fomenting utopia, um, creating out of focus armatures, um, invitations to aggregate incrementally, right? The Cities are the site of social legi legibility, the phenomenal scale at which collective political behavior organizes. Now, obviously, the place for me. This urban turn was overdetermined. I was born in Washington, D.C., and lived with my parents in a small apartment building opposite a wonderful park um, with a water feature that had arrived straight from Chivoli. Um, Meridian Park was built in a brownish concrete with a smooth pebble aggregate very tactile, um, laid out formally, but with plenty of spaces to hide, um, completely delightful from my four-year-old perspective. DC itself was a weird place, segregated, sleepy, southern, sterile. Um, employment was completely dominated by the federal government. My father, an engineer, worked for the Navy Department, uh, having come down from New Jersey at the outbreak uh, of the Good War. Um, Visits to his office, though, were thrilling, especially for the enormous glass-encased model ships, accurate to the river, breathtaking to a boomer boy child, and long thereafter the object of my visual lust, drawn over and over at home on big sheets of manila paper. Uh, planes fly, and even now my preferred pornography is aviation deep. Um, with its sexy interceptors, spaceships, high bypass turbines, super jumbos, urban air mobility systems, and especially post-crash for forensics and cockpit voice recorder transcripts. Um, back in my toddler time, DC was awash um, with men and, and a few women uh, in uniform, covered with ribbons and dec decorations, um, big red stripes and bright blue pants, um, an entire city uh, of village people um, dancing to the tune of dollars and death. Um, the city is richly, if degenerately, utopian. The nation's all at once capital and um, rising uh, from its swampy, pestilential site. Uh, L'Enfant's uh, Baroque plan, with its diagonals and monumental culminations, its regulations to keep a low character, rose just a bit above the height of a European pre-elevator city. Paris plus two, a machine for governing. As was expected of their generation, my parents moved to the suburbs and chose an unusual one, uh, a modernist enclave in Northern Virginia designed by Charles Goodman and landscape by Dan Tyler. Um, because of its advanced design, Holland Hills attracted a liberal crowd and was both formally and politically at odds um, with the surrounding subdivisions of mini Tars um, uh, and Dixiecrats, and it developed a semi-utopian vibe. Uh, people actually believed in the suburbs in those days, um, a cooperative and sociable enclave. Um, to experience Holland Hills is to make a connection between politics and architecture. Um, what looked to my grade school self like causation. Um, the community was, uh, however, uh, founded uh, with a stain, uh, a restricted covenant. This was eventually dropped, and in fact, um, Roberta Flack lived down the way for a while. Um, the pastoral mood was reinforced by an active dairy farm directly across the street from which cows periodically escaped into our yard, trampling the azaleas. My mother shooed them away with a broom. Both my parents showed an overwhelming, even Marie Antoinette-ish, impetus to garden. Where, where did they get it? Um, with the delicious strawberries, tomatoes, and carrots, however, came the onerous duty to weed and mow the lawn, which fell to me. Yeah, get out of here. Um, Holland Hills taught me about the merger of building and landscape, about how architecture really could attract and incubate particular cultures and social, social arrangements. 
about com uh, community um, and certainly about the thermal insanity of glass houses in the sweltering DC summer before air conditioning. Um, our next door neighbor was an aging, uh, highly anal retentive landscape architect, uh, a kind of surrogate grandfather, kind and engaged. Um, he'd worked for the Olmsted brothers uh, and for TVA and had one of the most intensively and gorgeously uh, cultivated half acres on the planet. I was sometimes allowed to bring my little friends into his bedroom where a hundred neckties ranging in color from beige to rust hung in their spectrum order, truly a designed life. There was a tight gang of boomer kids and we played and went to school together. But as an only child, I still felt hemmed in. My way out was riding my bike into DC to look at construction and feel um, such urban uh, energy as was uh, on offer in that benighted place. Um, the biggest building site at the time was the huge uh, urban renewal project in Southwest. When I got there, the poor African-American population uh, that had been there for a century uh, had long been expelled and their homes destroyed. It was all craned concrete floors and crushed memories. At the peak of these uh, urban escapes were holiday trips to New York. After tedious hours driving through flat, indifferent landscapes, it was exhilarating to arrive at the flaming dystopia of the Jersey refineries, spectacle and harbinger. Then out of the tunnel and into the city, chaos on a grid, coal scented perfume, a far cry from the asphyxiating fresh air that had drawn my New York born parents to the healthy countryside for the good of the child. Uh, which only increased my feelings of repulsion and guilt. I wanted to be a subway motorman um, racing through the dark quickly. Uh, I'll give you two Coca-Cola lectures. Um, fast forward to 1961. My mother, uh, a devoted reader of The New Yorker since the 30s, um, had a powerful Jones for Lewis Mumford. Um, shortly after its publication, she gave me a copy of The City in History as a birthday gift. It instantly became my Bible, as much for the images as the text. In Mumford's urban teleology, the long upward march of city development culminates at Volendu. Um, this became my dream city. I developed an especially passionate attraction to those <coughs> branching light poles, part of a general fascination I had with light standards, gasoline stations, and gas stations. Um, Sunoco was on top until those Elliott Noise mobile stations came along. I knew more about Sven Markelius than any other 12-year-old in the metropolitan area. I loved the idea of Sweden. I also loved Brasilia and made a model of the assembly building uh, when I was in grammar school. I remember not knowing how to construct a dome and had used both halves of the grape fruit, uh, painted white. Um, closer to home, uh, I adored Reston, uh, America Builds a New Town, rising on the other side of the county, near Saarinen's Dulles Airport, another pilgrimage site. Modernism straight up in service to the optimism of cities from scratch. I wonder how my trajectory might have been different had mom given me Jane Jacobs. Um, Death and Life was published that same year uh, instead of Mumford, um, thanks to a visiting explorer of Jane. Um, the big model uh, shares fami family values with a series of exquisite corpse style, um, rule-based urban exercises, um, urbanograms, that I've been doing with students for years. They were kind of limbering up at me. Um, I was very busy indeed with Utopia. Um, one product, project was, uh, product was a book, Local Code, that described an imaginary city uh, via an imaginary building code um, articulated without any direct prescription of form. In 1993, we were invited to be part of a show about urbanism uh, at the Museum of Contemporary Art in LA, uh, and we decided, what else, to design a, a new city. The result was Weed, Arizona, um, which sought to nail a few basic propositions. Um, weed rebalances 
uh, green, blue, and built space to incorporate key metabolic, make metabolic spheres. Uh, <laughs> make the Japanese care for the picture that don't get too diluted or they might be waiting for the name Tokyo. Um, uh, uh, to incorporate key metabolic functions, thermal management, water capture, agriculture, bioremediation of wastes, foot forward mobility, a body and climate based dimensional language, uh, and a loft centric inhabitation. Um, these lofts were to be um, architectural stem cells taking on any function in the sure to come golden age of benign systems. Um, they would conduce to free and easy mingling of neighborly people and activities. This anything anywhere mix reflects both a new sort of functionalism that favors the social and generates innumerable unpredicted, mainly happy accidents and serendipities the point of the city. We were also thinking about the loft's limits. Um, uh, uneasy, uh, another image of weed. Um, it sticks a lot. Um, uh, uh, un uneasy with the paradigms of either the Beauborg um, or Soho. Their architectures were ultimately inflexible, um, either too open or too hemmed in. In those pre-iPhone, uh, pre-Facebook, and pre-biometric recognition days, um, we weren't so worried about total surveillance and its assassination of privacy, um, making space irrelevant. Too late. Um, uh, is there anybody in the room who doesn't have a tracking device in their pocket? Um, naturally, there were exceptions to all this equipotentiality for structures of demanding purpose, like concert halls, um, uh, bowling alleys, hospitals, cyclotrons. Um, notwithstanding the whack form, um, weed is actually full of, uh, whoops, it's, uh, we're a little out of sync, full of traditional urban infrastructure, a main street, a waterfront, uh, and a fixed growth boundary. We were also naively thinking about the so-called peace dividend. Uh, uh, we were thinking that it might be for real, um, that the deck economy could turn to life. So weed occupies a small c uh, corner of the vast Yuma proving ground. Um, our thought was um, that the military was um, uh, in, in the sunset, the soldiers needed something to do, and the logical thing was to build some cities on their bases. Um, aspiring to both autonomy and equitable regulation, uh, weed uh, proclaims the urgency of building new cities in many forms uh, as antidotes to the mega metropoly slums and sprawl. The global urban population now grows by more than a million people a week. How many cities is that in? The urban DNA is all there in weed and connects our speculative and our real project. One compelling force in reifying this distinction um, has been our colonization by China over the past 25 years, and with it the opportunity to actually design cities, districts, neighborhoods, and buildings ab ovo. Um, in the great 1964 film by Jean-Luc Godard, Band à part, there's a hilarious scene uh, <coughs> in which Anna Karina, Sammy Frey, and uh, Claude Brasser attempt to beat the nine minute and 45 second record for running through the entirety of the Louvre. They knock two seconds off the time. The ironic seizure of this silly record set by someone oblivious to the actual art, an American, um, makes its point about Philistinism and latitude. Um, that trio rushing by a sequence of pictures in frames um, riffs, however, on the technology of film itself suggesting that recording more frames per second can enhance the scopic intensity uh, of what's projected. The flip side, uh, in stop time animation, where filming fewer frames per second accelerates the opening of a flower or the construction of a building. The two speeds simultaneously distort and enhance the gaze, shifting from rumination and appreciation for the individual art object to the competitive consumption of art in general. 
an empty vessel awaiting commodification. Um, and a fine metaphor for the asynchronous, hyper-branded character of daily life. Cities and the right to them are an antidote. As an homage to Godard, I will now attempt to set the record for the most projects shown in under nine minutes. Um, I predict this will be unsuccessful, um, even uncom incomprehensible. Um, but one last uh, historical, uh, one last historical prelude. As, as Rafi mentioned, in 2005, um, my studio underwent a long planned mitosis and split into a professional practice, Perkins Studio, and a nonprofit, Terraform, which conduct research makes unsolicited design interventions in a variety of vector urban situations and now publishes books uh, under the UR, or Urban Research Imprint, uh, urpub.org for the Fargo Center, Amazon. Um, I had optimistically thought that we'd flourish on the professional side in China uh, and that that side of the operation would cross-subsidize our we NGO. Alas, they both hemorrhage cash and the end of the month is always a crisis. Please buy some books. Um, Weed was followed quickly by Neurasia, um, a somewhat calmer translation into a different vernacular. Low-rise buildings we thought would be attractive to migrants from the countryside. Neurasia follows the readjusted ratios of green, blue, and built spaces, and the cross-ventilated, human-dimensioned, ubiquitous loft type, likewise sprinkled with special born um, places and uses. Anticipating by decades the Belt and Road, it was to lie along an imaginary line from Hong Kong to Hanoi, a node on a uh, linear system of linked cities. Bring on the Maghreb and the Hyperloop. Our first official city from scratch was a company town for what we were told was a sustainable timbering operation in Laos. Um, the looping forms of roads and pathways create a series of villages and allow the whole site to be easily traversed by bike or by foot. Public stuff is concentrated along the river or the bisecting main road through town. Uh, there would be wind power. Um, this uh, loopy figuration uh, periodically recurs, sometimes under the influence of topography. Um, in this fairly recent project near um, Coffs Harbour uh, in New South Wales, um, a thousand units surround Australia's finest golf course. Um, uh, as in Laos, there's a town centre along the main road to serve distributed village clusters linked by a network of solar-powered golf carts, a pretty benign form of mobility. All black water is treated on site. Um, and the gray resultant recir recirculated for watering and toilet flushing. Um, we've started designing the buildings um, and continue to develop and test the idea of pretty good architecture, um, sustainable, sociable, and as adventurous as it can be without alienating the client. Um, at about the same time we did this Coffs Harbor project, we won two competitions in Wuhan. The first was for a large satellite city um, located on the east side of town within a then less than pristine chain of lakes of great cultural, recreational, and hydrological importance. We determined that any water entering the lakes from the new city um, had to be cleaner than what was already there, which set us off on our usual metabolic inventory. It's an ur urban item of faith that every project we do be designed and vetted vetted to maximize uh, metabolic autonomy via well-distributed systems, including energy, water, waste, mobility, harmonization of population and numbers of jobs on site, recreation, health care, cultural facilities, and so on. Each project is also a demonstration project meant to push the practice along. Because of the lakes, uh, density and population are distributed in an archipelago of settlements. Um, these islands, we see that there's a kind of relatively autonomous relationship between the coast and the inland sea, you get that kind of running through the leaves. Um, uh, 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 these islands are not zoned but seeded 
and individual districts are focused on commerce, higher education, recreation, and entertainment. All are mixed in form and use, uh, and movement is foot first and bike beta, um, augmented by a dense network of ferries, links to the subway, and slow-moving benign surface transport, which we would propose be manufactured in an existing automobile plant adjoining the site. Um, the second scheme uh, was for a tech campus, uh, which we moved in the direction of completeness by adding housing, retail, recreation, and freedom from cars. The result is a functionally skewed but potentially energetic and convivial community, like a university campus, in which intensity is the outcome of both boundaries and affinities. Um, we continue to shamelessly borrow from what used to be called nature, uh, including uh, flora, fauna, and geomorphology. Um, another winning design uh, uh, was for an actual university city in Xi'an um, and for its economic hinterland. Um, and the idea comes from the widely used playbook that suggests that if you build Stanford, Silicon Valley will immediately ensue. Um, because of site boundaries and surroundings, the scheme is effectively an island, um, but fairly well harmonized <coughs> in use and metabolic. While Chinese state planning continues to impose an insane level of hair-splitting microzoning within a context of single-use districts, we've tried to ratchet up uh, the mix, um, thwart conventional adjacencies, and suggest sympathetic architectures with tiny towns out in the boob. Ah, some architectures with tiny towns. <laughs> Those are real photographs. Um, <coughs> anyway, we, we've done a lot of competitions in China and, and in fact won the majority. In every case so far though, um, the victory was the end of our involvement. Typically the scheme is sent along with the losing entries and the plans of other consultants to the local planning office, which takes from each what they like, according to their own version of a well-regulated utopia, consolidates, revises, and translates this into the default language of overzoning and superblock. Now, we accept being riffed off without acknowledgement or participation, both because we sometimes at least um, see our partie live on checking Google Earth to see if any of these cities have materialized. And of course, we believe in the power of propaganda. Um, neighborhoods uh, are the decisive increment of urban organization. And although they can't be designed, a variety of activating forms can respond to both anticipated and unexpected accretion. This uh, Mahale uh, Rehabilitation in Istanbul for a haphazardly built district at high seismic risk is protected by systematic building reinforcement and when necessary, uh, replacement, preserving its population in place. Um, threaded with greenways linked to adjacent neighborhoods uh, and checkered by small agricultural plots that were once abundant on this side of town. Um, the neighborhood, uh, this neighborhood um, was planned for the then decimated district of East New York in Brooklyn is a diagrammatic collusion of sketch and strategy. We wondered what was the least we could do uh, to transform this um, notional uh, drawing um, into something more legible. Um, planting a tree in an intersection calms and redirects circulation and creates opportunities to aggregate in the spill of its leaves. Um, in, an um, in an intersection, uh, the, the tree in the intersection gets things rolling, um, calming and redirecting circulation. Uh, oh, I read that sentence. The plan that emerged is for a twinned, um, low-density agrarian community balanced by densification uh, in red uh, at key intersections um, within the surrounding built fabric. Um, of course, there are many other possibilities uh, that might result from that tree in an intersection. Um, district and neighborhood scaled greenfill interventions um, in Xi'an and Chengdu, um, here mixed together, 
uh, are organized around circular central pots. Um, circles have been, uh, uh, circles have the most efficient um, area to perimeter ratio uh, in all of Euclid, maximizing building sites directly on the pot. If you think about these pages of pot, it's like a very wide circle. So I think it's more money. It's a good idea. Um, Um, we, fi we mixed things up as much as we could, uh, and we confronted uh, the major formal obstacle in Chinese urbanism, um, the inevitable high-level planning organization of cities um, into super blocks, generally containers for flocks of cloned towers. We downscaled the big blocks, introduced more variegated massing, uh, and extensively utilized mid-rise buildings to create street walls hence actual streets and urban spaces. Fortunately, the Ville Radieuse model seems to be relaxing a bit, and there are many uh, encouraging new slogans. Green city, smart city, park city, human-centric city. We just got an R RFP for a vibrant new Peugeot, um, beautiful large garden. Um, uh, this might loosen things up. Um, on the other hand, they may simply further reify uh, and camouflage the evil designs of Big Brother. Um, this project in Tianjin uh, takes on another hammerlock. Um, the insistence that all residential towers face south, um, you know, Hildesheimer on acid, um, attempting to subvert this maniacal um, but inescapably ingrained morphology, um, we wiggled east-west rows of a homogeneous residential type. I wonder if some of this is going to go in three weeks. Um, by threading the site um, with a network of pedestrian paths and keeping the cars in the plinth, um, we created spaces of opportunity for more particular publics and eccentric designs. Um, one project by Terraform, uh, I'm finally wrapping up the first volume of this fine work, um, undergirds all of this. We've been working um, for a long time uh, on an impossibly extensive research and design study called New York City Steady State, a detailed working through of the logics of the local. We wondered how closely aligned, how literally coterminous, we could make New York's ecological footprint with its political boundaries. Um, this thought experiment about the idea of a completely self-sufficient New York proposes, in the end, fragments of a theoretically possible utopia. Um, it also speculates about the degree and location of what, in the end, uh, makes that kind of self-sufficient city uh, unrealizable. The study investigates the broad range of our metabolism, and we began with food. Um, work will soon publish under the title Homegrown. Uh, we did design a complete system of urban agriculture uh, as a kind of a test case. And although we quickly discovered it was borderline ridiculous, um, the rigor of the experiment demanded that we think it through. Um, let's see what comes next. Um, energy proved to be the main obstacle. Too much needed and too much embodied. As the project it, it evolved, um, we shifted to other scales and filters including neighborhoods, hinterland, inequality, climate change, governance, and differences, while si simultaneously creating um, an appliance for doing the math that determines how low you can go. It's a monster uh, and really can't be summarized in fewer than 400 pages. Um, that would be another lecture. Unfortunately, I'm not getting there. Um, uh, to finally finish, am I? To finally finish, <coughs> uh, a couple of schemes for Zhanggan, a new capital city um, that will join with Beijing and Tianjin uh, uh, to form a triangle about 100 miles on the side uh, at the heart of an insanely burgeoning super city with an expected population of 150 million. Yikes! Um, Zhanggan. Uh, is to be the new home for non-capital functions relocated from Beijing, 
you know, the, the foreign ministry um, stays and the, the Department of Motor Vehicles goes, um, to the chagrin of workers who will be obliged to move far from the action. Um, Zhanggan um, will have the usual smart city bells and whistles, including autonomous vehicles, a common logistical layer, and as much green technology as can reasonably be packed in. Unfortunately, the site itself um, uh, couldn't be more environmentally inopportune. It lies directly beside Bayan Lake, uh, a fragile wetland, erstwhile kidney of North China. The entire territory is also at serious and regular risk of flooding. Our scheme is organized, you remember from the previous slide, uh, as an upper and a lower city. The upper city is dense and urban uh, with a complex lamination of mobility systems, a regular small block form, a low profile, extensive environmental and ceremonial uh, art infrastructure. In contrast, lamination, um, uh, the lower city is largely green, um, dotted with villages. In our original submission, um, these villages uh, were actually, <laughs> we didn't put Taiwan in enough. Um, <coughs> uh, um, uh, were actually existing villages that, that the authorities have described during our orientation visit to the site as having no value, uh, and they plan to wipe them out. Of course, we aimed for a high autonomy quotient, or AQ, um, and the city is self-sufficient in energy, um, utilizing solar, waste to energy, geothermal, and wind systems, um, is a closed loop for solid and, uh, is a solid, um, uh, is a closed loop for solid and liquid wastes, and can grow around 15% of its fruit and veggies within its boundaries. Um, we were invited to work uh, on a smaller portion of the site uh, at the bottom of the lower city um, based on the official consolidated plan. Next slide, it looks a lot like ours, Mike. Um, uh, in this case, though, um, I think we went a little too far for the authorities. Um, we proposed relocating uh, a planned site surrounding dike so that this terrain would become part of an enlarged lake, effectively a gain for water. Um, uh, building is on a group of uh, elevated islands connected by boats and bridges, each seated with a major function, Ella Jane Jacob, but otherwise mixed. Chinese character. Ah, okay. Um, uh, must I have the time just right now? Um, we know the usual objections to such apparently complete stipulation. It's hubristic, masquerading, dictatorial, top-down, anti-democratic, etc. Um, I don't see this problem. Um, this stage of planning is always speculative and provisional, not a sacred text, but a compilation of codes and lexicons, something to discuss and debate for now. We don't see such plans, speculative by definition, like that, rather as goads and lexicons, something to discuss and debate, alter and use. As the planet careens towards extinction level disaster, there's no alternative to thinking together at scale. All cities accrete around frameworks, explicit or implicit, concrete or notional. Prospective utopian imaginings of forms and consequences are not reality. Um, utopia is unrealizable by definition, a stimulus, not an outcome, a chimera. But the ideas stay in motion. Um, I think that would be enough for today, uh, except for one last creature. Oh, gee, oh the stands and the other fish. Um, uh, and one last image, my muse. Uh, and a final piece of advice, um, prepare every lecture as if it were your own.